Why, hello there. My name is Mike, and this is the Bored Cyborg. <laughs> Welcome back to yet another episode. Today I'm doing something a little different since I had a long weekend, since my hours have been cut because of the world being on fire. I was able to watch some movies and I had a really fun weekend watching horror flicks. A lot of older horror flicks, uh, basically from the 30s to the 80s. So um, I'm going to talk about five or six, maybe seven, five or six films or so that I've seen from Friday to Monday this past weekend. I'm just gonna call this video My Weekend in Horror, or My Horrific Weekend, or My Horror-Filled Weekend, or something like that. Before we get started, I know a lot of you have been watching movies since half the world, most of the world is on lockdown, on stay-at-home orders, so uh, feel free to leave down in the comments below what you guys have been watching, maybe your favorite film of the last couple weeks that you've seen. I'd love to get a little discussion rolling as per usual. The first film I watched to sort of kick off my weekend was from 1985. It's Ruggiero Deodato's Cut and Run. Ruggiero Deodato you would know from Cannibal Holocaust, most famously. And uh, Cut and Run is a better film, hands down, no question about it. This is a blast of a movie that handles three storylines really uh, very well. One storyline follows these reporters that are sort of um, going into the jungles of the Philippines, I want to say, to to find out what's going on with this drug business. Another story follows this uh, the the head of the the news company or one of the bosses or whatever. His son has been working with these cartels, so they're trying to find his son and bring him back home. Uh, and then there's this other, <laughs> I guess it's not much of a story, but this like hit squad that's led by Michael Berryman with a big ass machete uh, that is t that are taking out these these cartels and working with um, uh, the main villain Richard Richard. Oh, he's from Invasion USA. He always plays a good villain. Really rough looking face, uh, Richard something. Uh, Lynch, Richard Lynch, got it. Uh, but yeah, at Cut and Run is just a, a blast of a movie. Nice and violent, really, really well made Italian action horror crime film with some really fun performances. Uh, Lisa Blount is actually in this. Uh, some of you may know her. She's She's been in a, whole, a lot of horror stuff. I know her from Dead and Buried as the nurse, the deadly nurse. Great 80s synth Italian score as you, you'd come to expect from 80s Italian films. And like I said, it just balances a whole bunch of genres and stories really well and delivers the goods. It is a fun movie through and through that is cut and run. The next one I watched, I actually went back to the 40s. I was getting that itch for some classic horror. And this is from 43, I want to say. Yep, 43. This is Return of the Vampire. This is uh, Bela Lugosi donning the cape again. Not as Dracula, but as a, a, a vampire named Armand Tesla. Um, who is put to rest, I'll say, by our, our lead characters in the beginning, or a couple characters in the beginning. And then during World War II, a bomb goes off during the Blitz and dislodges the stake from his heart, or maybe maybe some clumsy gravekeepers removed it, and thus returns Armand Tesla. What a great vampire name, right? Who wreaks, uh, wreaks havoc as a vampire. This is Lugosi as a vampire. Do I really need to say much else? He does a great job in this. He's obviously got a lot more to act with um, in terms of acting like a vampire than the original film from 31. Uh, but this is just a really solid Lou Landers, by the way. Lou Landers directed this, a super prolific director from the 30s, 40s, 50s. This guy pumped out over 100 films in like three decades or four decades, if that, which is just incredible. Lou Landers, this is definitely one of the best ones that I've seen of his. I've seen a few. It's a fun movie. It's Lugosi. That's all that needs to be said. Lugosi as a vampire. You know what to expect. But this one actually also ties in some werewolf lore. He's sort of commanding this man to turn into a werewolf and back and forth and do his bidding. So it has those elements too, like Dracula and werewolf, which is kind of cool. Return of the Vampire. Next one I checked out was on Amazon Prime. That is Cassandra Crossing. This is a little known disaster film from 1976, directed by George Cosmatos. If you recognize Cosmatos, that may be because of Panos Cosmatos. Matos' son, who directed Beyond the Black Rainbow, and Mandy, as of late, George Cosmatos had a string of fantastic 80s flicks of Unknown Origin, um, Rambo 2, Leviathan, and then Tombstone in the 90s. I'm missing a couple there. But he, uh, Cobra, oh my god, how can I forget Cobra? 
just reeks of 80s aesthetic. I love Cosmatos as a director. He had a great string of movies in the in the 80s, and we lost him too early. But Cassandra Crossing was one of his, I would say, his first big film in 76, his first studio film, as far as I as far as I know. It is a disaster film that takes place on a train. And what separates this one from most disaster flicks at the of the time, this is a viral pandemic or epidemic that breaks out on the train. So I felt now was a good time to sort of watch this one for the first time. And um, it's got a great cast like most most of these do. Ava Gardner, um, Richard Harris is our lead, who's great. He, he's in the third act. He he's a doctor, but he's <laughs> in the third act. He's like fuck this. He takes up arms and starts starts fighting back, and it's awesome because basically the government gets in and tries to do some shady shit and try to kind of sweep this uh, this <laughs> truckload or, or train full of people under the rug. Burt Lancaster, by the way, is in this as well. Like I said, great cast and just a a fun solid, uh, Sophia Loren, solid disaster film. My real gripe with the film is it's a little overlong. Uh, it takes a while to get to the really good stuff. It just, a lot could have been cut, and cut out of it. Uh, just needed to be cut down a little bit. But what we do have here is a really inventive in terms of camera work and uh, just a really cool disaster flick that not many people talk about with some great effects in the third act, that is for sure, and some really cool miniature effects too. So check out Cassandra Crossing. Next up is my favorite of the bunch uh, that I'm going to be talking about today. That is The Man Who Could Cheat Death. This is one I've had in the collection for a long time. This is a Hammer film. This is a couple years after Curse of Frankenstein and a year after Horror of, Frank uh, Horror of Dracula. So this is really early Hammer resurgence stuff here. Hammer was making stuff in the 30s and 40s, but a lot of crime films that they adapted from radio plays. Um, and then, of course, in the late 50s they, or the mid 50s, they'd bring us uh, Quatermass Experiment. And of course, The Man Who Ke Could Cheat Death is sort of an amalgam of Dracula, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Dorian Gray, Jack the Ripper, just all these Victorian era ideas, story ideas, horror ideas, really. I love this film. Directed by Terrence Fisher. None other than the guy who directed tons of films for for Hammer and really kicked them off with uh, Horror of Dracula and Curse of Frankenstein. He directed both of those. The Man Who Could Cheat Death is fantastic. It stars Anton Diffring, who is a doctor who yearns to live forever. Of course, we've, we've heard this sort of story, but the way this one is told, it really does grab from a whole bunch of different sources and sort of makes its own thing, and it makes it feel fresh. And the performances alone... Honestly, guys, this is a slower movie. But that in no way takes away from how brilliantly acted and written and staged this movie is. It's a slow burn of a film with a lot of dialogue, but the dialogue is engaging and it keeps you on the edge of your seat. Uh, by the way, the, the other lead in this is Christopher Lee, a young, dashing Christopher Lee in a speaking role who really, really gets to shine. And uh, an older, um, older doctor too, and I forget... I forget, I, I don't know his name. He didn't act in much, but he was excellent too. Him and Differing going back and forth is just fantastic. Hazel Court is in this, another another uh, British horror sort of legend. If you haven't seen The Man Who Could Cheat Death, definitely check it out. Great effects, great makeup, superior acting, set design. That is really what carries this film. A lot of dialogue, but God damn is it interesting. So many great lines of dialogue. I love this movie, The Man Who Could Cheat Death. It quickly became one of my favorite Fisher films, one of my favorite Hammer films. Love this movie. And we go from my favorite that I'll be talking about today to my least favorite. That is sadly a Lucio Fulci film from 1982. Can you guess it? Some of you probably got it right, Manhattan Baby. Manhattan Baby is... Damn, it starts so good. This film, from what I understand, it was supposed to be Fulcio and um, his producer, D.D. something, his producer's biggest film in terms of budget. He was given, uh, he was given Fulci, like, full reign on this one, all the money he needed to do this sort of Egypt, Egyptian and New York 
co-production. A, a lot of this film is, or at least a lot of the first act is shot in Egypt, and it's phenomenal. I mean, Fulci shoots Egypt wonderfully, as you can imagine, um, and it just looks great. I was like, is this really Egypt? And then there were the shots that I was like, this is definitely fucking Egypt. And they're in catacombs and things like that. Some of that may, may have been a set, but who knows? It, it looks legit. It's awesome. And then we get to Manhattan, which is Manhattan, but there's really not many like establishing shots to really make it feel like New York. We get a, a poltergeist kind of ripoff here, and it's just not intriguing and not very fun. And we get one decent gore scene towards the end, which is which definitely helps the film quite a bit. But what I was getting at with the budget of this film, uh, the, the producer, this was the last time produ the producer and Fulci worked together. They worked on The Beyond and Zombie and all the big Fulci films, his his trilogy, his Gates of Hell trilogy. The producer just halfway through the, the production just slashed Fulci's budget, some say two thirds, some say half, which is incredible. So even if it was a quarter of the budget, that's still a big hit. And I, I could tell that Fulci, Fulci's his vision definitely took a hit because of the budget decrease. And that, that seems pretty f***ed up to do after such a good good relationship they had. So the film really struggles. It, it, no memorable characters, no characters you root for. Um, it also, Fulci always has an obsession with eyes. You know, he's always zooming in on the eyes and poking things into eyes, but this film has too many shots of fucking eyes. Despite it being one of the main themes of the the movie you know the sort of the eye of horus sort of thing it's just not a good one it's probably my least favorite fulci film um new york ripper i think is a little bit better than yeah it's no new york ripper is a better film than this i just don't like new york ripper too much but manhattan baby is kind of a mess watch it for the egyptian scenes watch it for some of these special effects Ugh. I wish it was better. That is Manhattan Baby. And last but certainly not least, in fact, my second favorite, I finally got around to watching another Invisible Man movie. That is Invisible Man Returns. I've This was the first time watching it, and um, I f***ing loved it. Uh, not as much as the original Invisible Man, but goddamn what a great sequel that nobody really talks about, The Invisible Man Returns. It's excellent. And guess who our Invisible Man is? Vincent fucking Price. This was really Vincent Price's... This was his big break. Uh, he didn't really get into his horror big break until William Castle in the mid to late uh, 50s with House on Haunted Hill. He gets to play a character that we never... We don't see until the last minute of the film. But he is there in the last minute of the film. We get to hear his voice. It's all physical. It's a very physical performance, very vocal performance. And it's excellent. He does phenomenal and of course he does it's vincent fucking price he was like 28 doing this which makes me feel old but um such a great movie the effects are ramped up the, these were always you know universal's really their 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 special effects showcase you know what they could do with invisible man and even invisible man returns some great effects some things that i'm just like how the how did they do that? You know, it's just, it's excellent stuff. No Claude Rains, but Vincent Price steps into the shoes of Claude Rains perfectly. Plays a, a, a man who is wrongfully accused of the, or is he, of the death of his brother from the original film's Claude Rains character, Griffin. His brother or cousin or something is working to, to break Vincent Price's character out of prison by giving him this invisible formula that makes him invisible, obviously, and easy to escape. Um, and as time goes on, it's sort of the same thing. Uh, it's cool because we see Vincent Price's character going mad because of the invis invisibility. When the Invisible Man starts up, 33 Invisible Man, we already, he's already mad. Uh, it picks up and, and the, the Dr. Griffin has already lost his mind and he progressively gets more and more dangerous and volatile. But in, in Invisible Man Returns, we see Vincent Price's transition from a normal guy that is accused of a murder he didn't commit and see him seeing him transform and utilize the power of being inv invisible you know sort of the power of a god and it's a really really interesting character study one of my favorite universal monster movies that i've seen thus far i haven't seen the rest of the invisible uh, man and invisible woman films here but i will i'm just savoring these movies you got to understand i've seen almost all the frankenstein dracula mummy and Wolfman movies. So I'm really savoring the creature ones and Phantom of the Opera I haven't seen and I'm really savoring the invisible ones. So goddamn though. Love the Invisible Man Returns. 
The Invisible Man Returns. I just want to thank you for checking out my video showcasing my weekend in horror. Watched a bunch of films this long weekend since my hours have been cut and we're just trying to get by, staying at home and staying sane. I hope you guys are all staying safe and staying as sane as possible. Uh, make sure you take care of your mental and physical health during this time. It is important. I'd love to know what your favorite movie of the ones that I showed off today are. And if you don't have one, maybe you haven't seen any of the movies that I showcased today, definitely check them out for one, but also let me know what you've seen down in the comments below and we'll get a little discussion resolved. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up. And if you're new to the channel and want to see more videos like it, go ahead and hit the subscribe button as well as the little bell for notifications. Anyway, guys, I will see you next time. Bored Cyborg, out. I can't lose. I can't lose.